Okay, everybody, welcome to the first episode ever of Nunley Math. I'm Aaron Nunley, your host. I'm a humble math teacher from Ohio. I'm trying to put together a video series on Algebra 1 to help my classroom students um, learn how to do algebra more effectively and efficiently. So I'm teaching straight to them. Um, but hopefully you guys can learn something or fixing something up along the way. Um, I know there's a lot of teachers out there putting videos um, of math out on the internet, but this is this is my attempt to contribute something to the world of education. So um, we're gonna we're gonna do the very best we can. We're gonna see how this goes. Uh, my goal is to get every lesson from the uh, year onto YouTube so that uh, my students can watch these and and maybe some other teachers can watch these and pick some things up along the way. If if not, maybe they can contribute and tell me some things I've missed and help me uh, improve as an instructor. Um, either way, I'd appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe below. That'll let me know that you're out there and listening. And if you want to leave some comments in the comments section, certainly that's welcome as well. Um, with this being our, our, our first episode, I would like to talk to you about some very basic ideas um, about Algebra 1, talk to you about some things that sometimes we as algebra teachers tend to gloss right over and maybe invest a little bit of time into things that you may think you already know and understand, but if you really haven't fully developed conceptually, um, they can create you create some issues for you along the way and down the road. So what I've done is I've taken what would be the first lesson of my class um, and I've tried to break it down into two lessons because I've been told that these YouTube videos need to be relatively short. Um, and so I'm going to try and, and split this up over two separate videos. So if you like this one, go ahead and watch the second one. I would encourage you not to give up too quickly if this first uh, video seems a little bit tedious because it is tedious and it is it is uh, that way on purpose because as I mentioned before we are trying to go into some great detail about things that often get glossed over. Most importantly I really want to focus on one big main idea. Um, uh, we have a tendency as math teachers to try and cover a lot of different ideas all at once, but for today, this one big idea is is really paramount to something to, to what you're going to want to do for the entire year, and that is all of algebra is based on the idea that there are certain patterns in num that exist in numbers. These patterns are regular, predictable and unchanging. Regular, predictable, and unchanging. The rule, these rules can be relied on, they can be counted on, and everything that we do in Algebra 1 is based upon these rules. Now, it is important for us to make sure we understand these rules very, very well because applying the rules in creative ways allows us to find the answers to seemingly complex problems. In fact, most of what you do in Algebra 1 and a lot of what you do in Algebra 2 is based on the rules we're going to talk about today. Here are two properties that I wanted to make sure I mentioned first because um, they are properties that a lot of times at first glance seem very, very obvious and so most math teachers don't take the time to mention them and if they do mention them they don't really spend a lot of time on it. Um, I know myself in the past have been guilty of glossing over these two properties but I've tried more and more as, as the years have gone by to spend extra time on these because I'm beginning to, to get a better understanding of how relevant they are to what we're trying to do in algebra. Algebra 1. So the reflexive property simply says that x equals x. Remember x is a variable and it stands for any number. This property then says that anything or any number or any real number is always equal to itself. So you might say that 5 is the same as a 5 or negative 4 is the same as a negative 4 or 1 half is the same as a 1 half or 0.3 3 tenths is the same as 3 tenths. When you see these, um, your tendency is probably to look at those and go, well, yeah, that's so obvious. Why do we even bother to make a rule out of this? Why would anybody bother to say that 5 is equal to itself? And for a long time, I felt the same way. I didn't quite realize it until as I was teaching Algebra 1, I realized that this expression or this equation right here, x, equals x is not one that is given to us in most cases, but rather when we're solving large and complex equations, 
we often end up with x equals x as a result. And when this occurs, it tells us some very important and very specific things. And that is whatever equation we're working with, whatever problem we're solving, whatever application we're doing, has an infinite number of solutions. In other words, no matter what we put into that equation, it should work out because the two sides are always going to be the same. If we have a 5 on one side, it's going to be equal to a 5. We have a half, it's going to be equal to a half. So this is a way of saying no matter what number or value you pick, it's going to work. Now there is a geometric application um, as well that I often um, would tend to ignore, and that's this. If you have two triangles, one on top of the other, triangle A, B, C, the triangle A, B, C, the larger triangle, and triangle D, B, E. This is the smaller triangle that exists on top of it. A lot of times that picture or that figure will show up in geometry. It's considered to be two similar triangles. So the same shape, just different sizes. If I were to split those two triangles so you could see them both better. I take this larger triangle and I move it down here to the left. I take the smaller triangle and I move it down here to the right. You can see both triangles not overlapping. But I want you to notice something. This angle B is here and here. The measure of angle B is the same as the measure of angle B. This is a geometric way of showing the reflexive property. If you have two angles and they're both angle B, and you can see they are when we overlap, you can say that this angle B is the same as this angle B. And that becomes very, very useful when you're trying to uh, find missing angles or missing sides or areas of triangles. Um, not, uh, not something that comes up a whole awful lot in an algebra one class, but certainly in geometry next year, being able to recognize that those two things are equal to each other is very, very important. It's called the reflexive property. Let's not overlook it. Property number two, the symmetric property, goes like this. It says, if A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. If A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. A lot of times we as math teachers put that up there. We say learn it, but we don't really talk about it very much. Um, it basically tells us this. If two things are equal to one another, it doesn't matter what is on the right and what is on the left. They are still equal to each other. So I try to explain it to my students like this. I say, I go to the store and I want to buy something that costs some money. Let's say it costs $1. Okay. If I walk up to the, uh, to the clerk and I say, I don't have a dollar, I only have four quarters. Do you think that uh, the, the, the person at the store is going to accept that, the clerk is going to accept that? Of course they are because they are the exact same thing. I could create a similar story where I said, okay, I want to buy four items that cost a quarter each. If I don't have quarters, I could just as easily give the clerk a dollar because four quarters and a dollar are the exact same thing. Um, they're interchangeable. An equal sign doesn't mean anything except to say that two things are the same. And if they're the same, it doesn't matter which side I write it. On. Now, for some of us, we're saying, yes, that seems obvious. Why do we care? Why do we even talk about it? Well, when we're solving equations, for example, 12 equals x minus 9, you'll find that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with having the x on the right side of the equal sign. This rule gives us permission to say, well, if 12 is the same as an x minus 9, we can feel comfortable switching that order and putting the x minus 9 on the left side of the equal sign and the 12 on the right. They're the same thing. If 12 is the same as this, this is the same as 12. Remember, everything we do in algebra has to have some form of a justification. We can't just do whatever we want because we want to do it. We have to have a purpose behind it. The symmetric property is the purpose. The symmetric property is the permission to make that change. You'll remember the one big idea I said we should mention is that math or algebra is regular, predictable, and unchanging. We have to make sure that if we if we make a change to an equation, if we do something in algebra, that we can justify it by one of these regular and predictable patterns.
Sometimes just being able to rearrange things makes a problem easier to work with. Property number three, additive inverses or opposites. Additive inverses or opposites. Again, this is one that most of us are going to feel pretty comfortable with. I want to make sure I mention it because if you looked at the title slide, um, we are talking about solving equations and this is going to be a very, very important principle for us when we begin to solve algebraic equations in part two of this video. The additive inverses property, or the property of opposite says, if I have a number, any number, it doesn't matter what the number is, and I add it to its opposite, the solution or the sum will be a zero. Two numbers that add up to zero are called additive inverses or opposites. Some examples of these might be one plus negative one equals zero. One and negative one would be additive inverses or opposites of one another. 8 plus negative 8 equals 0. 8 and negative 8 are additive inverses because they are opposites of one another. They add up to be 0. 130 plus a negative 130 equals 0. Therefore, they are additive inverses or opposites. And I can make this more complex if I want to. 3 fifths plus negative 3 fifths. When we're adding fractions, the rule is we simply add the numerator. 3 plus negative 3 equals zero fifths. Oh, and zero fifths is zero. Additive inverses. Uh, very, very important when we begin discussing solving equations. Uh, hold that in your mind. Multiplicative inverses or reciprocals. The rule says a times one over a equals one. In other words, two numbers that have a product of one are multiplicative inverses or reciprocals of one another. Some examples of this might be three times one-third equals three-thirds. Three-thirds is a form of one. Remember, when we're multiplying fractions, a three by itself is three over one. Three over one times one-third, multiply the numerators, you get three, multiply the denominators, you get three, three-thirds is a one. Notice that three over one and one over three is simply uh, uh, one, or if you repl re replace the numerator and denominator or, or switch the numerator and denominator, you do end up with the multiplicative inverse. So if I have seven over one and I flip that over, I get one over seven. Seven times one is seven. One times seven is seven, guess what? Seven sevenths is a one. Seven and one seventh are multiplicative inverses or reciprocals. Two fifths, if I flip that over and make five halves, two times five is ten, five times two is ten, ten over ten makes a one. This is fairly easy to find if you know that you're looking for it. Um, it is worth mentioning that mixed numbers are very, very difficult to work with um, when we're talking about multiplicative inverses. Um, it's much easier to take a mixed number like two and a half, turn it into five halves, because once it's in the form five halves, finding the reciprocal is very, very easy. One thing I do want to point out about the inverses, additive inverses always make zero, Multiplicative inverses always make a 1. We spend extra time talking about 0 and 1 for very particular reasons. And that, uh, that reason is the identity property. The identity property is one of the most important tools we have when we're solving equations because the identity property says if you can take a number and add a zero to it, it's the same as that number by itself. Or a simple way to say that is adding zero doesn't change the value of the number. Now if I back up just a little bit to the previous slide, notice in the additive inverses, we found a way to create zeros. With multiplicative inverses, we found a way to create ones. So if I can create a zero, it's very helpful to me because adding zero doesn't do anything. It's like my son when I ask him to clean his room. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> That's the best joke I've got, sorry. So if I have five plus zero, it equals five. Negative four plus zero equals negative four. 0.3 plus 0 equals 0 
and 1 half plus 0 equals a half. No matter what number you start with, if you add a 0 to it, it doesn't do anything. So if our goal is to get rid of something, if our goal is to try and get a variable by itself, trying to turn everything else into a zero is a very, very good strategy. The identity property of multiplication says, taking a number and multiplying it by one doesn't do anything to the number. This actually is a typo. This should be, let's uh, fix this real quick, pointer options, pin. This actually should be an A, but my pin is not working. 1 times A equals A. You can fix that on your end, I think. 1 times A equals A. I'm going to spend one more second if I get this to work. Maybe my ink color is wrong. Let's change it to black. 1 times A equals, oh, there it is. That should be just A. And we'll scribble this guy out a little bit. 1 times A equals A. Multiplying by a 1 doesn't do anything. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. Oh, that's terrible. You can tell this is our inaugural edition, huh? Multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. So if I have a 5 and I multiply it by 1, it's still a 5. If I have a negative 4 and I multiply it by 1, it's still a negative 4. 0 0.3 times 1 is still an, a 0 0.3, and a 1 half times 1 is still a 1 half. Now, some of you are saying, okay, that's a little bit redundant, but there is something else the identity property does allow us to do. Multiplying by 1 can change how a number looks without changing its value. For example, I know 5 times 1 is equal to a 5. But I can change that 1 into a 2 halves. I can change that 1 into a 2 halves. 5 times 2 over 2 is 5 over 1 times 2 over 2, or 10 halves. 10 halves has the same value as 5. I know that because I only multiplied it by a 1. Now, this particular one changed the way it looked, but it didn't change its value. Ten half dollars is the same as five dollars. Take a look over here. I could do five times three-thirds and make it into fifteen-thirds. Notice that three-thirds is a form of the number one. If I can draw that. It's a form of the number one. Five times one doesn't change value. It stays the same. If I have pies that are cut into thirds, if I have 15 pieces and each piece is a third of a pie, do you know how much I have? I have five pies. We've changed the way it looks, but we have not changed its value. And I can come up with an infinite number of variations of this. I'm going to go ahead and stop here for the day. Um, that is a total of six properties that we are going to want to know. Um, very, very important that you catch on to those. In part B of this lesson, we're going to apply those strategies to solving equations. I'm going to spend a great deal of time talking about how these can help us solve equations. And if we can hammer that down, you're going to find that Algebra 1 is going to be a whole lot easier for you. Um, one last thought. This one comes from The Rock. I grabbed it from his site, addictedtosuccess.com. It says, be humble, be hungry, and always be the hardest worker in the room. I promise you, if you are the hardest worker in the room, you are going to have far more success than anybody else doing the same task. Um, as always, this is Mr. Nunley. Best of luck to you all. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Bye.